Hello, this is Jason Young, missionary to Australia. Uh, we are um, just uh, making this video and uh, introduction to our family. And uh, this is my wife, Hannah, and I have five children, starting with Abigail, Jeremy, Jacob, Jesse, and Ariel. And we've been serving the Lord here in Australia for uh, since 2006. And um, we are, I am a graduate of Pensacola Bible Institute. I graduated there in 2005, and I thank the Lord that He called me into the ministry and counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And we are sure thankful that we can be used to the Lord here in Australia. And um, many of you may or may not know, but my history goes as I graduated from Bible school, the Lord dealt with my heart to surrender to missions and to be a missionary. And when I did that, um, the first place that God led me to go was to Malawi to be with Brother Flick. He was my first first time off of American soil and onto the mission field. And we got to visit there and uh, be with Brother Flick for a few weeks there in Malawi. And uh, it greatly affected my heart for missions. I, I do remember surrendering my heart and life in his bedroom floor in a prayer meeting with me and Brother Heath Fusner and Brother Flick uh, there on his in Malawi. And we prayed and I surrendered my heart. You okay, honey? I surrendered my heart to the mission field and be used in God's service. And I came back to prepare my heart to go to Malawi and God changed my plans 180 degrees and sent me to uh, Australia. And we've been here ministering uh, to the saints here in Australia and God has blessed us. We have a ministry here, a church. Um, the Lord has allowed us to be involved in the street ministry. We go out in the streets uh, regularly uh, every, uh, every week and sometimes twice a week. And just this past Saturday and, and Thursday, we were out on the streets. Uh, God has blessed that ministry. Over the past three weeks, we've even seen four souls be saved during door knocking and, um, and uh, into the streets and things of that nature. And we thank the Lord for that. We have a gospel ministry here where we can uh, send out. Um, we have a bookstore ministry. We have a public ministry. And just recently, the Lord, we're training about four preachers right now and for the service. Um, to be sent out of here. Uh, we have ordained one man, and he's graduated from Bible Institute, and we sent him down to um, Oladulla, about three hours south of here, to plant and start a Bible-believing church. That church is now 14 months old, and uh, it's been through a lot with the coronavirus and things like that hitting and bushfires, and they need your prayers. Uh, uh, Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church in Oladulla, Australia. And so be praying for that work. And so we just wanted to uh, introduce ourselves and tell you what we were doing here. We're, we're training men uh, centrally here in Sydney, Australia, to send them out into the work. Our prayer and our desire is to see uh, Bible-believing uh, churches started all over Australia. And we're working towards that goal by training and raising up men out of this church. And so be praying for us uh, as we do that. We are the Young Family uh, Missionaries to and in Australia. And thank you for your time. And we pray that God blesses your missions conference there in uh, South Africa. And if we can, if we can do anything or pray for you, we will be. Uh, and thank you for your time. God bless you. All right, you folks, give us just a moment. We're going to try to get set up to sing you guys a special song. For those of you that don't know, this is my daughter. <laughs> and we're allowed. We're allowed not to be socially distanced because I love. But it's very nice to have her and her family play the piano for us in the church. So whenever she's back in town, it's nice to have her behind the piano again. This might look a little strange, but it's what we got to do so that the people on the live stream can also hear it. We're going to sing a song for you this morning called, Lord, You're the Best Thing That Ever Happened to Me. <clears throat> You've been my friend for so long. You were right. And I was wrong, I can't repay you all the love you've given me. You were my friend when no one cared. I was alone, but you were there. Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I owe it all to you, Lord. All I have is yours, Lord. So take my life and make it what you'd have it be. For I'm your child and you're my father. I'm the clay and you're the potter. Lord, you're the best thing 
that's ever happened to me. Borrow treasures, borrow dreams, all life's joys you've given me. When trouble comes, you're always there to make me smile. So come what may, thy will be done. I love you, Jesus, God's only Son. Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I owe it all to you, Lord. All I have is yours, Lord. So take my life and make it what you'd have it be. For I'm your child and you're my father. I'm the clay and you're the potter. Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. Amen, amen. All right, that, tr that song is abundantly true, isn't it? Amen. All right, let's open up our Bibles this morning now to the book of Acts. Handelinge. Handelinge hustig ian. That's Acts chapter 1. And in your left hand, if you would like to get the book of 2 Kings, we'll be in chapter 7. For those of you that have the outline there handy, you can see the uh, structure of the sermon today and a few of the verses we'll be taking a look at. Acts chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse number 6. And today, preaching, I believe, a very fitting sermon for the close of our missions conference this year. The title of this morning's sermon is The Uttermost. The Uttermost. What do we mean by that? Acts 1 and verse 6. The Bible says, When they, therefore, were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now see what's happening. Jesus, for 40 days, has been telling his disciples all about the kingdom of God. And in their minds, let's stay put. Let's, this is great news. We're going to have the kingdom. So let's just stay here and let the Messiah come and give us our kingdom and fix our nation and we'll be good. Will thou at this time give us the kingdom? Verse 7, he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And with that being said, let's bow our heads together and pray and ask God to help us with this message. Father, please, as you've been doing so many weeks, months, years, coming down and meeting with us on Sunday mornings. We're asking that you do it again. Please speak to our hearts and help us, Lord, to see clearly what's, what the importance is of reaching the uttermost. We see the emphasis you put on it. Please make it real in our hearts this morning. And I ask that you please fill me with your spirit. Help me to preach and give all of us ears to hear. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can I point something out to you in verse 8 that I believe is, is noteworthy? Jesus says in the middle, Ye shall be witnesses unto me. And look at the next word, both. Do you see that word? Both. In Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus doesn't tell us only focus on the uttermost part. You also need to focus on your hometown. You need to be busy telling others about the Lord, trying to, reach him, trying to reach them with the gospel here and far off at the same time. We'd like to keep that same balance in our church. We don't mean to ignore Pachastruum and all the challenges going on here in South Africa. Plenty of work to be done. There's a plenteous harvest in South Africa. Yet at the same time, Jesus says, don't ignore this great commission to go into all the world. 
and preach the gospel to every creature. The disciples were focused on their own land. And I understand that. They live there. That makes good sense. Jesus redirects their attention to the uttermost part of the earth. Which raises the question, why aren't more people that profess Christianity concerned with the uttermost part of the earth? Why, for so many Christians, is this a non-issue? We would like to think that simply because Jesus commanded it, it's important. Wouldn't it be nice if it was that simple? Jesus said this is important, so I'm going to put it very high on my list. It will be a priority to me. I don't even need deep and further explanation. I don't need a lot of reminding. Jesus said to do it. We're going to do it. I can remember a time in my life when foreign missions and missions at all, in any sense, home or abroad, it's not that I had anything against it, but it didn't make a lot of sense to me. I, I wasn't that concerned with it. My aunt, she was a missionary nun for more than 20 years in Nigeria. My great uncle, he was a missionary priest in Brazil for, if I understand, over 40 or 50 years. He just recently passed, I think, a week ago. I have six great aunts that are nuns, missionary nuns in different places of the world. So foreign missions is not a foreign thing to me. I've been around it my whole life, but it never really sunk in. Why should I care about it? Me personally, why should it be a big deal? As I said, Jesus giving us the Great Commission. Is everybody familiar with that term? The Great Commission? To go into all nations, teach them, baptize them, and then disciple, make disciples, right? That's the Great Commission. Jesus has given this commission, then as Yellow say, finished in clar, right? That, that should be enough on the subject. However, I think there is one key aspect that needs to take place in everybody's life so that missions, home and foreign, really ring loud in our hearts. There's one thing that gripped my soul and changed my mind about missions forever. I'm going to use the story in 2 Kings chapter 7 to illustrate that. So if you would turn there with me in your Bible. 2 Kings chapter 7. Second Kings chapter 7. And we'll begin reading in verse number 3. 2 <clears throat> Kings 7 and verse number 3. If you're not familiar with the context of this story, Israel has been suffering a horrible famine because they have been besieged by their enemies. The Syrians have laid camp all around them. They can't get in or out. It's, they can't get any fresh supplies or food. It's a horrible, horrible time. If you see in chapter 6, if you take the time to read it later, women were actually cooking their own children. They were that desperate. It was such a dire time. And we pick the story up in chapter 7 and verse 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? What a great question. What a great question. Why sit we here until we die? Verse 4, If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. <laughs> this is pretty sound logic. One way or the other, we're going to die. <laughs> if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. In other words, what do we have to lose? At the, ver at the best, we're going to find help we know that there's no help in our hometown. So the point number one on your outline, if, for those of you that like to fill it in and follow along, go to the, and then I've given you a blank there, go to the uttermost. That's the first thing in your outline. Go to the uttermost. And I'll show you in just our next verse why that is point number one. Let me first 
bring your attention to a potential connection that you have to these lepers, not leopards, right? They don't play for the rugby team, the leopards. These are lepers without the D, leprous men. There's a strong connection to, to you and I as sinners. You see, the disease of leprosy in the Old Testament, this is something we can relate to now, it required quarantine. Not just for 14 days or 10 days, you know, have a COVID test and you're done. As long as you had leprosy, you had to be separated from the people of God. You had to live beyond the outskirts of the city. And this leprosy, if we had time to really dig into it, you can see it's a, it's a tremendous picture of sin. It's a tremendous picture of the spiritual disease of sin. Maybe you've heard this verse. I've given it to you on your paper there. Isaiah 59 and verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. Do you see the separation that comes in a person's life between God and that sinner? And it's because of this disease of sin. That's the condition these leprous men find themselves in separated from the people of God without hope what else are we waiting for we're just going to die the wages of sin is death that's all that they knew that's all they were expecting and they thought well if we're going to find any help at all we can't just sit here we can't just sit here and wait for things to change let's go investigate let's see if there is help somewhere else Let's go to the uttermost. So verse number five, and they rose up in the twilight. Now, if you look deeper into that word twilight and the Hebrew word behind it, this is most likely the late evening, right? The sun's gone down and now under shade of night, they are sneaking very quietly and carefully, timidly, scared almost, going toward the Syrian camp to see if they can find help. This reminds me of Nicodemus. How many of you remember that story in John chapter 3? Nicodemus, uh, one of the higher ups as a Pharisee, ruler in the, uh, among the Jews, he comes to Jesus by night, the Bible says. Why? He's he has questions. He knows that there's something deep down that's missing. He has religion but he doesn't have a true relationship with God. He knows what his forefathers have always believed, but he himself lacks that personal walk with God. And he's heard that there's something special about this Jesus guy. So he goes under shade of night to investigate. Jesus, he's considered a fringe leader. You know, he's way out there. This Jesus guy, he's way out there. You know what Nicodemus did? He went to the uttermost. I'll go look anywhere to see if I can find help for the need of my soul. Verse 5, they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to thee, what's the next word? Uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. They did not expect that. They expected to walk up to the boundary where the Syrian camp had been set up and find an entire army standing against them, ready to kill them simply because they were Jewish. And when when they got a little closer, they said, this isn't nearly as scary as we thought. This is... This is strange. This is not what we thought. You know, there's a lot of people, they hear things about Christianity. They hear things about these followers of Jesus. And they're not really sure. You know, some of it's just gossip. Some of it's scandalous. And oh, you hear all these bad stories about preachers uh, stealing the money and running off and hypocrites in the church. And it makes people a little shy, a little scared. I don't know about this Christianity thing. But if you take a closer look, you'd find, wow, this is a lot better than I thought. This isn't nearly as bad as I thought it would be. They're getting close to investigate. But notice they went to the uttermost part of the camp. Now, you please, if you give me a little grace this morning, I am playing with the word uttermost. I fully understand that. 
In, in the book of Acts, when we read uttermost part of the earth, we're talking about going as far away as you can, right? Okay. We've almost reached the uttermost part of the earth here in South Africa, right? <laughs> At least I feel as if I've, I've done that because I came from America and it's so far. Now, when we read in this verse, the uttermost part of the camp, try to keep in your mind the picture of what's going on. Israel, right? The, the, the town Ephraim specifically has been encamped round about by these Syrians so when we read uttermost part of the camp it's not crossing over all the tents in the entire camp to the other side of the Syrian camp not that but where the Israeli border and the Syrian border as far as the camp is concerned they just reached the very edge of it they haven't gone deep into the camp of the Syrians. That's what they mean by the uttermost part. They've just reached the very beginning. Are you with me there? They've just reached the very beginning. In verse 6, For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites. And the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. I don't know precisely what God did to make this sound appear to these people. Maybe there was a mighty rushing wind. Maybe. Whatever the case was, these Syrians fled for their lives. And now these four lepers, they find all the provision, everything they need right there in front of them. Here's what I'd like to point out. God cleared a path for them. Right? God cleared a path. These men, they had doubts in their mind as to whether or not this would work. But once they got there, they realized, wow, we, we were not obstructed, no hindrances, nobody tried to stop us, and now that we're here, nobody's attacking us. How does that equate to our situation? You know what the devil's going to do, and the world's going to do, and your flesh is going to do, and maybe your friends and family. There's so many things that might present a challenge and hinder you from coming to Christ. You have these doubts, you have these concerns, you've heard these stories, and and now, for whatever reason, today, here you sit, maybe even at home, watching on YouTube, here you're going to have a chance to, to find out what Jesus Christ has done for you. God cleared a path. 2,000 years ago, He sent His Son. 33 years, Jesus lived on this earth without one sin. And then goes to a cross, and on that cross, all of your sins were put on Him. God has made a way for you to come home. That barrier that was separating you and God, it was put on Christ and He died in order to remove those sins. It's not only that God sent His Son to clear a path, God also sent His Spirit. You see, when Jesus came, here He comes to die for the sins of the world, but then after Jesus goes back to heaven, we read that the Spirit comes down. What is He doing? He is sent to search for each individual sinner and draw that sinner back to God. He is sent to tell that sinner what Jesus has done to make it possible to come home. God has cleared the path. He's made a way for you to get back to Him. You're, you have to start by going to the uttermost, by giving Christianity by giving Jesus Christ a chance. Go take a look for yourself. You can't just sit in the gate of the city where everything's going wrong and say, well, I've heard this and that about Christianity. Investigate it for yourself. Find out for yourself, what is this all about? You have to approach these tents. Look what happens in verse number eight. This will be part two of our outline. First, you go to the uttermost. You have to investigate, look into Christianity. God will make, he has made a way so that you can hear the truth. But then in verse eight, part two on the outline, get saved to the, here's the word, uttermost. <laughs> this 
This is a very creative sermon, isn't it? <laughs> Get saved to the uttermost. What do I mean by that? Verse 8, And when, those, or when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. They had just reached the very beginning of the Syrian camp. What did they find? Everything that they were looking for and more. They hadn't even gone very deep. They're just getting started. And they had just gone into one tent and they find this abundant treasure waiting for them. Can you imagine the look on these lepers' faces? How excited they must have been. Oh, this is so much better than what I thought. Oh, I'd heard stories, but wow. Can you imagine? Look at this. This is, oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. <laughs> I don't know if the, they didn't have that song back then, but man, they had to have been excited. They are, they are finding things that exceeded their expectations. Can I ask you, if you would, hold your place here. Hebrews 7. I, if you want to look on your paper, it's there on the paper. It's Hebrews 7.25. If you'd like to see it in your Bible, you're welcome to turn to Hebrews 7 and verse 25. Let me show you how you and I would find something applicable in this. The book of Hebrews is one of the most fascinating books in the New Testament. It presents several challenges, but also such tremendous truths. One theme that you find running through all 13 chapters is this. Jesus is better. What a great theme, right? Jesus is better. In chapter 1, he's better than the angels. In chapter 2 and 3, he's better than Moses. In chapter 4 and 5, he's better than Aaron and the Levitical priesthood. And uh, he presents a better covenant with better promises. And everything about the book just glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ and shows that he is better. He's just better. He's just better. Hebrews 7 and verse 25. It says, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. In the chapter specifically, the author is drawing our attention to how the Levitical priesthood and the law could only do so much for the people. But once Jesus came, He takes them so much farther. He takes them to the uttermost of what God wants to do in a person's life. You understand the law is not a bad thing. The law is a good thing. Even the Apostle Paul said the law is good. The law is spiritual. It came from God. The law is not bad. The, the problem is us, not the law. The law served its God-intended purpose. What was that purpose? The Bible says by the law is the knowledge of sin. The Bible says that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. The law always was limited in its scope. It was never intended to be a permanent fix for man's soul. It was meant to show us our need for the permanent fix to show us that we've sinned, we've fallen short of the glory of God, and that through Jesus Christ, Him dying as a sacrifice for our sins, we can be made whole or reconciled. Right? We were separated. We can be brought back to God. So what the law could not do, Jesus Christ can do to the uttermost. He doesn't save us temporarily. When you accept Jesus Christ, He gives you eternal life and He says, you'll never perish. Neither shall any man pluck you out of my hand. He says, if any man comes to me, I will in no wise cast him out. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. This is the promise that He hath promised us, even eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. 
Jesus, he gives us something that no one else, nothing else, no religion, no church could ever do. He saves to the uttermost. You say, does this mean that I need to accept him as my Lord and Savior and then live for him and then I'll find all of these great blessings at the end of my life? No, no, listen. As soon as you come to the uttermost part of the camp and just stick one toe into that tent of salvation, you just peek in temporarily and go, what's going on in here? You go, man, this is wonderful. In the Lord Jesus Christ, I find everything that satisfies the longings of my soul, a purpose in life, a reason to get out of bed in the morning a way to fix my marriage, a way to handle my job, a way to deal with my fellow man. In South Africa, it's filled with political chaos, financial chaos, racism, hatred, all sorts of crime and sin. And and yet in Christ, we find stability, an anchor for the soul, someone to give us a solid foundation in order to deal with all the chaos around us. He is the order that makes sense of life. That's why he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I've given you another verse at the bottom of your paper there, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. Paul said, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You see, when we enter into the tent of salvation, we find there all that we need to make our life come right. Understand, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that you become rich and healthy and all of your problems disappear. But you find a personal relationship with Christ. You find a connection with God that will sustain you for the rest of your days. You find a treasure that you can hide deep down in your heart and your soul. And every day, each situation, I tell you, the Lord will not disappoint. Here's, I think, one of the greatest things about this story that we're looking at in 2 Kings. They entered into one tent and found all that their bodies needed. We enter the first day of salvation. (laughs) The moment you receive Christ, you find all that your soul needs. You are saved to the uttermost right then and there. Folks, please understand, we are not waiting to receive eternal life. If you have received Christ as your Savior, you, present tense, have eternal life. We understand eternal life sometimes as immortality. And and that's a misunderstanding. Immortality is that you live forever. Now, that is something we receive in Christ. We have a promise of a new body. We have a promise of a resurrection. But immortality and eternal life are not the same thing. 1 John 5, verse 20, John said this. He's speaking about Jesus Christ. He said, this is the true God, listen, and eternal life. Eternal life is a person. It is a personal relationship with the one who generates life. So walking with God, knowing God, That is experiencing eternal life. That is the treasure that we have in this earthen vessel. We have the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and it's hid within our tent. (laughs) Solomon gave us this line, brilliant. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8, listen to this. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Wow. I love that because as we get to the uttermost part of the camp, enter into the first tent, I'm blown away by what I find. I get saved to the uttermost the day that I receive Christ. But there's another tent and another tent and another. Now now listen, we don't need to get saved over and over again. But you do need to grow in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grow in grace. Walk further with Him. Go deeper. Don't just stop at the uttermost part of the camp. See what else God has for you in the next tent and in the next tent and see what He'll teach you next week and next month and on and on it goes. I can tell you after 24 years of being saved, 
Oh, it gets better as life goes on. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And that is so true when it comes to salvation. Back in 2 Kings 7 and verse 9, if you would, please. 2 Kings 7 and verse 9. And this is point number three on your outline. Give it your, let's see if you can guess what the word should be. Give it your uttermost to go to the uttermost. Hey, (laughs) give it your uttermost to go to the uttermost. Let's see if this works itself out in this passage. Verse 9, then said they, or then they said one to another, we do not well. Now, why is that? They found this great treasure. They hid it. They go back and get some more. They hid it. Sounds okay. Sounds like a normal human response to finding treasure. They said, ah, this isn't good, guys. We have all we need, probably for the rest of our lives, right? You're finding gold and silver. This is a pretty good day. We do not well. This day, verse 9, is a day of good tidings. Did you know that that phrase, good tidings, is another way of saying gospel? The word gospel means good news or good tidings, glad tidings. This day is a day of good tidings. And we hold our peace. That's the mistake they're making. It's a great day. We have found what we've been looking for. And we're not telling anyone. We're just sitting on it. As the old saying goes, we get all we can and can all we get and sit on the can. (laughs) That's what they've done. They said, we're not doing well if we tarry till the morning light. Some mischief will come upon us. So if we just sit here on what we've hidden until the morning, something, something bad's going to happen. If you don't mind me going a little bit deep and prophetical here, the morning light in the Bible, when you speak of that prophetically, is always a picture of the second coming of Christ. Now think of that in light of this verse. If we just sit here until Jesus comes back without trying to tell others about this wonderful treasure we found, we do not well. And we're, we're going to get in trouble. Some mischief is going to befall us if we just sit here. If we tarry till morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. They, they are rather ambitious, aren't they? They could have said, let's just go tell some other Israelites, some other common folk, you know. They said, we got to tell the king about this. Now, why is that? Why, why this initiative to take the message to the king? Because this message is so important. If you tell the king and convince him, he can then tell everybody. These lepers knew by themselves, they, they don't have the physical being. Right? They're not healthy enough to go to every individual in Israel and tell them this great news. Tell the king, he will command the necessary people to carry the message, and everybody in Israel can hear about it. They made a plan, a smart plan, to disseminate, to spread this good news. I'm going to say that they did their utmost to get the message to the uttermost. They dared to dream big. Let's not just tell five or 10 or 20 or 40 or 50 people. Let's see if we can reach the entire nation with this good news. Ever since I've been saved, I, there's a desire deep down in me that what I've experienced, the difference that Christ has made in my life, I just don't feel right about keeping that to myself. Now, listen, now that I have been to the uttermost part of the camp and I've stepped foot in that tent of salvation and I have that treasure of Jesus Christ living within me in this earthen vessel, I just don't feel right about not doing my uttermost to get the message to the uttermost. I told you at the beginning of the sermon that what I see in this, there's one thing, one aspect of this 
that changed my mind about missions? It's very simple. I got saved. I got saved and began to apply. Not just I've accepted Jesus as my Savior, but I began to apply what He had said to my life and the way that it transformed me. If it can do that for me, I want other people to experience that as well. Now, I, I don't expect you to be blown away by some deep, fantastic thought there. That's very simple and practical, isn't it? But if you have also experienced the saving grace of Jesus Christ, if He has transformed your life, don't you want to see other people have that same experience? Don't you want to give it your uttermost to get the message to the uttermost? Look at verse 10 with me. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied and asses tied, and the tents as they were. And he, that's the, the main porter, he called the porters, all the other gatekeepers, and they told it to the king's house within. You see, these lepers did not reach the entire nation by themselves, but they did what they could. You know what I find in this? Most of us in this room, God is probably not going to call us to go to another nation. And there's no shame in that. That's, that's, that's how this has worked out in the New Testament. But we should also still feel the necessity to do what we can with this message. We cannot just sit on the day of good tidings. Let the gospel have its day. That's what they said in verse 9. This day is a day of good tidings. So let's allow the gospel to have its day. Once somebody has experienced and seen what the gospel can do to an individual and to a nation, it is hard to reverse your thinking then and say, ah, we don't need to tell anyone else. Wow, there, who doesn't need to hear it? How can we not be concerned? Let me give you a few examples before I close today of what I mean by the transformative power of the gospel. You know the Apostle Paul, he said this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, listen to the next part, to everyone. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is not limited to one people group. Christianity is not just a white people thing. It's not just an American thing. It's not just a, it's not just a Jewish thing, right? Because it did spring forth from that. The gospel was meant to transform anybody's life anywhere. Look at what it did in the Apostle Paul's life. Here you go from what we would consider a terrorist, a religious terrorist, and completely transformed into where he was preaching the message that he once tried to exterminate. Folks, you wouldn't recognize me. If you were to look back at me when I got saved, I was 20 years old, the life I was living, the way that I sounded, you would not recognize me at, at all. When I was a teenager, listen, I wanted to grow up and be a black man. I did. That was my desire. I, I adopted African-American culture. Everything about me was that way. You can ask Christina. Christina. Because we were dating before I got saved. Every other word out of my mouth was a cuss word. You, you, you've seen people sagging their pants? I did that before it was popular. <laughs> you have a, I can see some of you are like, what? Pastor, don't try to picture it. Just take my word for it. Jesus changed me. He changed me. The first man I trained in Malawi was a guy named Ashbad. His name is actually Archibald, but the way that you say, you say it is Ashbad. It, it, you say it real quick, Ashbad. Ashbad went out witnessing one day. He gave the guy a gospel track and began to speak with this man. And the man was very tense and very nervous, sweating. You know, you could see he was tense. Ashbad took him through the gospel, and at the end of it, he said, Sir, would you like to be saved? The man said, Yes. With tears coming down his face, he asked Christ to save him. And after that man prayed, you know what he did? He took a knife out from his, his, he had a knife put in his belt there. He took the knife out and he showed Ashbad. He said, 
Pastor, I'm glad you found me when you did. I was on my way to kill a man. He said, he dropped the knife. He said, I'll leave that life behind. He showed up in church the next Sunday. He ended up a few weeks later getting baptized. And after that, he went through the discipleship class and ended up, he's still in church today to the best of my knowledge. You see, this, this message, it's not, oh, it works in America. No, it can, anybody's life. The worst of the worst, wherever they're from, whatever language they speak, whatever they look like, it can change that person. Many people know the name Charles Darwin, but what they don't know is the story about Darwin visiting a particular island called Wollaston. He, there he met, and I, I hope I'm saying the name correctly, Fugians or Fugians, F-U-E-G-I-A-N-S. Fugians, I think. He met these people, and this is what he said. These are his own words from his journal. These were the most abject and miserable creatures I anywhere beheld. These poor wretches were stunted in their growth, their hideous faces debauched with white paint, their skins filthy and greasy, their hair entangled, their voices discordant, and their gestures violent. Darwin had actually thought that he found the missing link. He did. He said, these people are less than human. They could not communicate like human. They slept like animals, all huddled up, naked next to each other. They... He said, nothing about them looks human. They have to be the missing link. There was another man on that ship, the HMS Beagle, that famous journey that Darwin took, a man named Admiral Sir James Sullivan. Sullivan was a Christian. He shares his account of it. He says that this is what Darwin mentioned. Darwin's conviction was that it was utterly useless to send missionaries to such a set of savages. Darwin had said that. What's the point? They're not even human. Despite Darwin's concerns, missionaries did go to that island. And a few years later, they wrote back to Sullivan. Sullivan passed the message on to Darwin and said, the Fugians now are completely different people. They sit, clothed, bathed in their right mind, speaking with each other, loving each other, showing all of the attributes that Christ commanded. Here's what Darwin said. I certainly should have predicted that not all the missionaries in the world could have done what has been done. It is most wonderful and shames me as I always prophesied utter failure. It is a grand success. I shall feel proud. He's writing this to a missionary society. Darwin says, I shall feel proud if your committee thinks fit to elect me as an honorary member of your society. And for the rest of Darwin's life, he himself never converted, but for the rest of his life, he gave money to a missionary society because he could not deny the power of the message of the gospel. What a tremendous testimony. If you would, bear with me just one moment. You know that I've showed you this book several times. John Patton missionary to the South Sea Islands. He labored amongst the people of Tana and Aniwa. I'm reading a story to you now from the 10th year of his work there. The Tanians, they tried to kill him. They chased him from the island. He went to the island of Aniwa. He labored there several years. He told the Aniwans, I'm going to dig a well. And they said, what's a well? He said, I'm going to dig until I find water. They said, they called him Missy, Missy Patton. Uh, for missionary. They said, Missy, no, 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 no. The rain comes from the sky, eh? not from the ground. You don't dig in the ground for the rain. And they, over and over again, for months and months, Missy Patton in there with his shovel, digging in the ground. And the, a couple times, the, the well collapsed. Oh, and, and the the Aniwans, they made fun of him and mocked him and said, Ah, Missy Patton, your Jehovah God, he has you confused. He has you looking for rain on the inside of the earth. Oh, poor Missy Patton, he's lost his mind. One day, Missy Patton dug deep enough and the water began to bubble up. And when it did, the chief 
of the Aniwans. I'm going to read you now what he said. His name was Namake. Friends of Namake, men and women and children of, Ani of Aniwa, listen to my words. Since Missy came here, he has talked many strange things we could not understand, things all too wonderful. And we said regarding many of them that they must be lies. White people might believe such nonsense, but we said that the black fellow knew better than to receive it. But all of his wonderful stories we thought the strangest was sinking down through the earth to get rain. Then we said to each other, the man's head is turned. He's gone mad. But the missy prayed and wrought on, worked on, telling us that Jehovah God heard and saw and that his God would give him rain. Was he mad? Has he not got the rain deep down in the earth? We mocked at him, but the water was there all the same. We laughed at other things which the missy told us because we could not see them. But from this day, I believe that all he tells us about his Jehovah God is true. Some day our eyes will see it, for today we have seen the rain from the earth. Then rising to a climax, first the one foot and then the other making the broken coral on the floor, fly behind the war horse pawing the ground, he cried with great eloquence. So now he's stomping. He's, he's making a big speech of it now. My people, the people of Aniwa, the world is turned upside down since the word of Jehovah came to this land. Who ever expected to see rain coming up through the earth? It has always come from the clouds. Wonderful is the work of this Jehovah God. No God of Aniwa ever answered prayers as the Missy's God has done. Friends of Namake, all the powers of the world could not have forced us to believe that rain could be given from the depths of the earth. If we had not seen it with our eyes, felt it and tasted it as we here do. Now, by the help of Jehovah God, the Missy brought that invisible rain to view, which we never uh, before heard or saw. And, beating his hand on his breast, he said, Something here in my heart tells me that the Jehovah God does exist. The invisible one whom we've never heard nor saw till the Missy brought him to our knowledge. The coral has been removed. The land has been cleared away and lo, the water rises. Invisible till this day, yet all the same it was there, though our eyes were too weak. Are you starting to see what this village chief had figured out? That the water of the well was a metaphor. He figured it out. So I, your chief, do now firmly believe that when I die, when the bits of coral and the heaps of dust are removed, which now blind my old eyes, I shall see then the invisible Jehovah God with my soul, as Missy tells me, not less surely than I have seen the rain from the earth below. From this day, my people, I must worship the God who has opened for us the well and who fills us with rain from below. The gods of Aniwa cannot hear, cannot help us like the God of Missy. Henceforth, I am a follower of Jehovah God. Let every man that thinks with me go now and fetch the idols of Aniwa, the gods which our fathers feared, and cast them down at Missy's feet. Let us burn and bury and destroy these things of wood and stone, and let us be taught by the Missy how to serve the God who can hear, the Jehovah God who gave us the well and who will give us every other blessing. Listen. For he sent his son Jesus to die for us and bring us to heaven. It took Missy Patton over 10 years to get that message home. And finally, through the water of a well, this chief found the well of everlasting life. This is what the Missy has been telling us every day since he landed on Aniwa. We laughed at him, but now we believe him. The Jehovah God has sent us rain from heaven. Why should he not also send us his son from heaven? Namake stands up for Jehovah. What follows on is the entire island of cannibals becoming Christians. The entire island. People say, well, what are the fruits of salvation? I'll tell you what Missy Patton saw as the fruits of salvation. He said, I can tell they're saved because they put clothes on. Isn't it strange? We, we look for other things. He said, now they put clothes on 
They come to church every Sunday. They don't work on Sunday. They come to church. And he said, they pray over every meal. He said, that's how you can really see that there's been a change. He said, Pastor, what's the point? The gospel makes a difference. It turns the world upside down. It brings to light what for others has been invisible their entire existence. But it requires somebody to go to the uttermost part of the camp, get saved to the uttermost, and then realize how great this treasure is. Let's go as far as we can to the uttermost part so that other people can experience this as well. Let's all stand, if you would, please. Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Heads bowed, eyes closed, just for a few moments. My fear is that I would overcomplicate this simple thought. Because I have experienced the saving grace of Jesus Christ personally. I know what a difference He's made in my life. It makes me very interested to take this same good news as far as I can. And if I personally can't do it, then I'll tell the porter of the city and let him tell the necessary person. I want to give it my uttermost to go to the uttermost. I'm asking you this morning, have you have you done your own investigation? Have you come to the uttermost part of the camp? Have you entered that tent of salvation and found how good God is? Do you know how great it feels to hear the voice of God whispering in your soul, forgiven? You're mine. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And as you go from tent to tent, to day to day, learning more about God, it just gets sweeter as the days go by. It's an undeniable fact. Wherever this gospel message has reached, it changes people. It brings that life right. Now, if you've experienced that, let's take it to the next person. If you haven't, if you've never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, I'm going to offer you this today. Please come and find me right after the service. If you're interested, no one's going to force you. You come and find me and say, Pastor, I'd like to know a little bit more. I wouldn't mind looking into this tent and just seeing what Jesus is offering me. It's worth your time. Whatever you do, don't just sit there till you die. Get up and go see what it's all about. Go to the uttermost. Father, thank you this morning for your help. Thank you, Father. Thank you for that uttermost salvation. For this wonderful eternal life. You did what nothing else, what no one else could do. This hungry and thirsty soul... Like you said, Lord, I'll never thirst again, never hunger again. And you were right. You were right. Lord, we we as a church would love to see other people in in our town and in the uttermost part of the earth hear this good news. Show us what we can do. Show us how we can support this great work of missions. And finally, Father, if there's somebody here that's never been saved, please, God, might this be the day that they quietly make their way 
into that tent of salvation and find everything that their soul has been looking for. Oh, what joy, God. Please let it be today. Thank you, Father, for allowing us these three weeks to concentrate on missions. Might it never leave our hearts and minds how important this subject truly is. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.